Good evening, everybody. How are you all doing? It's <laughs> hoping for something more substantive, but that'll do for now. Um, we are Chicago Rhythm and Juice. We are U Chicago's premier and only a cappella group, as well as the oldest. <laughs> what did I say? Only a cappella group. <laughs> <laughs> the premier and only Jewish a cappella group on campus. Um, there are lots of lovely a cappella groups. Um, um, you can find us on Spotify. We are going to be going on to a tour to New York City um, this winter. We um, should have an album out um, prepared towards the end of the school year. <laughs> you can hear Rafa's um, snide commentary over here. <laughs> and uh, tonight we are singing Le Chouffe Vita, which uh, we felt was appropriate given that it's Thanksgiving because it's about coming home and about sort of being able to find home like no matter what situation you're in. And um, also Hashana, which is about peace. Yeah, hope you enjoy the show.
Dearly beloved, <laughs> we are gathered here tonight to bring the sharpest minds of our generation together to address one of the most pressing, pressing conundra of our moment, latka or hamantash. I'm Anna Levin Rosen. I'm one of the rabbis at University of Chicago Hillel. And this evening, we will frame this question through the lens of the cosmos. Which of these Jewish holiday foods is the most out of this world? We've always been a people connected to the firmament. On the second day of our creation, the Torah says that the heavens is created, and by the fourth day it is the moon and the sun. And this happened far before human beings or any Jewish culinary tradition came into practice. And stars are often offered as one of the most poignant metaphors for the future of the Jewish people. In Genesis 22:17, we read that God has promised to Abraham, I will bless you. And God says, may your descendants be as the stars of the sky and as numerous as sands on the seashore. May your descendants be stars. <laughs> I'm not quite sure that that's what God had intended, but so it goes. When we talk about space exploration, we ask the question, 
What does this have to do with the latka and the hamantash? Everything, of course. Let us begin with Kennedy. <laughs> While we thought that President Kennedy was a faithful Catholic, his commitment to space travel had its own Semitic character. <laughs> his famous speech began, we set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. This sounds universalist enough, but then he said, as I remember hearing my rabbi quoting when I was a child, we Jews, too, go to the moon. <laughs> because that goal we will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that is one challenge that we are willing to accept. So, space travel is inherently Jewish. <laughs> because when have we ever, as a people, done anything the easy way? <laughs> but back to the Laka and Hamantash, the foods of the holidays of Purim, and the stories of Hanukkah and Purim, they both translate well to space. We begin with Purim. The story goes like this. In Shushan, the capital city of Persia, uh, the Persian Empire, a beautiful woman, Esther, hides her Jewish identity and encouraged by her uncle Mordechai, marries King Ahu Ahasuerus. Haman, the king's top advisor, seeks to destroy the Jews out of jealousy for Haman and a desire to plunder the Jewish communities. Now, we think, what does Purim have to do with space? Mordechai discovers the plot and tells Esther, and Esther calls out to the king and says, Shushan, we have a problem. <laughs> the king says, what is it? And she tells him that the villain is trying to destroy her people. It is one small step for Haman, but one giant leap against mankind. Now on to Hanukkah. It was when Jerusalem came under control of Antiochus III, the Seleucid king of Syria, who allowed the Jews to live there and to continue practicing their religion. But then his son, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, proved less benevolent. Ancient sources recount that he outlawed Jewish religion and he ordered the Jews to worship Greek gods. And in, six, oh, in uh, 168 BCE, his soldiers descended upon Jerusalem, massacring thousands and desecrating the city's holy second temple. <laughs> when the holy space station was desecrated, and the Maccabee astronauts were determined to have it working again, fuel was low. There was only enough power for the lights of that space station to last for one day. But by a Hanukkah space miracle, there was enough jet fuel to last eight days, allowing for more oil. Well, you know the story. And since we're talking tragedy, as we always are. <laughs> we take a moment to think about Jews in space. I'd like to remember one of the heroes that our family honors because my children are obsessed with astronauts. We think often of Ilan Ramon. He was the first Israeli astronaut to fly for NASA, and he was aboard the space shuttle Columbia in which he and six other crew members were killed on reentry. Ramon is the only foreign recipient of the United States Congressional Space Medal of Honor. And although he didn't identify as religious, before he planned his trip, he investigated how he could recognize 
the Sabbath in space because there's no 24-hour days. But now on to something a little more lighthearted. Gamatria. <laughs> in this theme of space, we are in a moment right now in a debate as great as the one between Latka and Hamantash. <laughs> the space race. The space race, this space race, privatized space travel. Who will launch it for real? The shelves of bookstores are overflowing with books like Rocket Billionaires, Elon Musk, Jen, uh, Jeff Bezos, and the new space race. And everyone has their own theory. Little did we know the questions of this new space race and the Laka versus Hamantash are interlinked. Tonight, we may find an answer to both if we engage in the classic Jewish method of making meaning where there is none. <laughs> Through Gamatria. By attaching a Hebrew number to each of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph Bet, we look at problems that plague humanity and add more and more layers of complexity. <laughs> Right here we have latka, these are two Yiddish words, and hamantashen, latka totaling 210, hamantashen totaling 455. So we ask, what do these have to do with the new space race? We look at Elon Musk and add up his digits. <laughs> Landing at 350, which one might assume is the temperature at which you bake hamantaschen. <laughs> but it is also the exact temperature at which you fry latkes. And so we were stuck until we look at space X. 60 plus 80 plus 60 for the Hebrew. And what's the gematria for X? Well, if you know your Roman numerals, we get 10. So <laughs> we now know that SpaceX 210 has the exact same gematria as Latka's. And so whoever wins might be the victor of the modern space race. <laughs> Thank you to Caleb, Cameron, Chase, and Noah for helping me realize that rabbis can be funny. And at a certain point, you just need to turn the question over to another rabbi. So, without further ado, please, Ruth. Good evening. My name is Ruth, and I'm the president of the Hillel Student Leadership Board. We are really so glad that you're all here, and we want to thank everyone who has helped make this great event happen. We especially want to thank our partners at the university, the Gamunder Family Foundation, who has generously sponsored this evening, and the hundreds of people who support Hillel every year. Tonight especially, we are grateful to be part of a university with such talented faculty and staff who are committed to the really tough questions of our times, especially the one that we're addressing tonight. Without further ado, introducing for his very first performance as debate moderator, Dr. Josh Fagelson. Okay. Uh, good evening, and welcome to the 72nd annual Latka Hamantash debate. My name, uh, as mentioned, is Joshua Fagelson. I'm dean of students in the Divinity School here at the University of Chicago, and it is my distinct honor to serve as the moderator for tonight's debate. I realize I am stepping into large shoes. Previous debate moderators have been legendary professors, some of whom even sported British accents, which gave them an extra air of distinction. So I approach this august role with what I hope is an appropriate degree of fear and trembling. 
Uh, it goes without saying uh, that this year's debate takes place at a pivotal moment in our nation's history. Polls have shown greater polarization this year than ever before, with some historians speculating that the country is riven by deeper division than at any time since the infamous latka Hamantash disputations of the mid-13th century. <laughs> it is, of course, seared in our cultural memory that those disputations resulted in rifts between the Latka and Hamantash communities that lasted for decades until, in, in fact, centuries, until they were momentarily set aside during the second Matzabal Congress held in Krakow uh, in 1906. There we go. Uh, indeed, indeed, <laughs> the, uh, the data are troubling. As this slide shows, the Pew Research Center reports that a higher percentage of the public hold extreme pro-Latka or pro hamantash views than at any time in recent memory. If we dive further into the data, we can see, <laughs> we can see in this series of scissor graphs the sharp partisan divide, indeed it is sharp, <laughs> sharp partisan divide between the pro latka and pro hamantash camps. Perhaps most striking in reflecting our deep national fracture, there we go, are the, <laughs> there we go, and the chart, charts in the top right and, and bottom left that uh, I draw your attention to. Uh, fully 69%, ooh, I can't touch that thing there. Okay, there we go. Fully 69% of the uh, pro latka Oh, crap. There we go. Okay, there. <laughs> Good. Okay. Hear me, baby, hold together. All right. Fully 69% of pro latka citizens say they can be friends on social media with people who like latkas. Not surprising. But only 24% of pro hamantashan citizens say the same. And even more striking, fully 75% of pro latka adults say they would not allow their child to marry someone who prefers hamantashen, <laughs> with the numbers reversed when we turn the question around. Additionally, we can see the declining trend in bipartisanship, whereby just 12% of hamantashen supporters say it is socially acceptable to like both latkas and hamantashen, whereas 44% of latka supporters say the same. And we can observe a couple of sociological changes. First, a uniform decline. Uh, a uniform decline in respondents who say they have a relative, most, perhaps most typically a grandmother, who makes poppy seed filled hamantashen. And number two, a striking increase in latke eaters who put ketchup on their latkes. <laughs> Research. Research conducted by the Institute for Latka Hamantash Politi Politics, ILHOP, here at the <laughs> University of Chicago, suggests this reflects both food tastes among the millennial generation as well as aggressive lobbying by the ketchup industry. <laughs> Further, we know that our media is divided. and that segmentation strategies, <clears throat> segmentation strategies are increasingly pushing us apart by building highly granulated profiles based on socioeconomic factors and social media usage. The latte sipping, Subaru driving, avocado toast eating, uh, hamantash and partisan on the one side, and the pickup truck driver who gets coffee at the local Denny's and loves his latkes. <laughs> As Pew summed up their findings, quote, for more than two decades, partisan polarization has been a powerful force in American politics. Today, the divide between pro latka and pro hamantashen citizens on fundamental values dwarfs demographic, religious, and education differences. What is striking is how little common ground there is among partisans today, even on issues on which latka tiers and hamantashiners have moved in the same direction. For example, growing numbers in both parties say matzo ball consumption should be accepted rather than discouraged. The partisan differences are wider today than in the past. Now, Jewish tradition is, of course, no stranger to deep division and debate. As the Mishnah, the wellspring of Jewish law, edited by Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi in the second century, famously says, 
Every argument that is for the sake of heaven, it is destined to endure. But if, if it is not for the sake of heaven, it is not destined to endure. What is an example of an argument for the sake of heaven? The argument of Hillel and Shammai. What is an ex example of the argument not for the sake of heaven? The argument of Korach and all of his congregation. That's real, by the way. Okay. <laughs> okay. The rest. Um, okay. In a forthcoming, in a forthcoming dissertation here at the Divinity School, doctoral candidate Ruven Zimmer <clears throat> elucidates a recently discovered manuscript from the famously reclusive 12th century great-grandson of Rashi, Rabbi Yitzchak the Schnorrer of Mines, <laughs> who comments on this passage. So he says, what was the subject of these arguments? The latka and the hamantash. And some say, and some say it was about the labor unionization of graduate students who teach in the university, whether they are considered students or workers, and this requires further study. And I hope that I still have a job since the provost is in the audience. So we see that these debates, excuse me, so we see that these debates go back at least as far as the 12th, as 12th century Ashkenaz and potentially much farther. Without spoiling what is sure to be a landmark work of scholarship, I will add that Ruvain Zimmer has given me permission to share that his forthcoming dissertation will draw on Geniza fragments, recently discovered letters of Glickel of Hamel, never before heard audio recordings, and archival documents provided by Dean John Boyer to argue that the Latka Hamantash debate here at the University of Chicago is, in fact, a direct descendant of similar debates held by the Jewish community of Cologne in late antiquity. So stay tuned for that one. But back to our own time. <clears throat> All of the foregoing serves to remind us that tonight's debate comes at a critical juncture when the need to find ways for pro-Latka and pro-Hamantash citizens to live together is acute. As your moderator, my hope and expectation is that our debaters will, in the very best traditions of the University of Chicago, offer us intelligently constructed, rigorously researched, and passionately advocated positions along with family recipes. I also hope and expect that in so doing, they will model for us the culture of intellectual inquiry for which the university is known and that our country and world so desperately need. Uh, I am also uh, happy to announce the involvement of the provost's office in the selection of tonight's debaters. You will note that they come from the disciplines of philosophy, psychology, and economics, and that two of them teach in the college, with Professor Worthington teaching in the Harris School of Public Policy. All of these scholars are therefore generating significant revenue for the university. And on behalf of the Divinity School, I want to say thank you for enabling us to be here. All right. The format for tonight's debate will follow standard Oxford rules, uh, as well as the rules of Hoyle, a noted Hamantaschen partisan, and the rule of St. Benedict, uh, famous for his apologetics on behalf of the Latka. <laughs> oh, and that's okay. That's as far as I should go. So without further ado, I am now going to introduce uh, Benjamin Callard, our first uh, debater. That's right. Yes. Uh, ben was born in a small Jewish village or Schwitz in Poland uh, in 1871. That part of his life now seems, to, uh, now seems to him looking back at it like some peculiar dream. He attended Central High School in Philadelphia, uh, alma mater of Noam Chomsky and Larry Three Stooges Fine, got his BA from Brandeis uh, and his PhD from Berkeley and has taught in the philosophy department at the University of Chicago for the past 10 years. Last year, he received the Janelle M. Mueller Award for Excellence in Pedagogy, uh, Professor, Cal Professor Callig. Please. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, so I'd like to thank Rabbi uh, Anna Levin Rosen and Hillel for the invitation to participate in uh, this debate. It's a great honor. Uh, when I first got her email, I decided to read up on the history of the debate, and I learned what many of you already know, uh, that the debates began in the 1940s among a small group of Gentile professors. 
in response to the unwelcoming atmosphere at the time. It's easy to forget what it was like in those dark days. Uh, Gentiles were outsiders at the university <laughs> and in American society more generally. Though Gentiles contributed their share and more than their share to the national culture, even writing ironically most of the endless Hanukkah songs that start playing on the radio earlier and earlier every year, they were frequently given the cold shoulder. Often they felt the need to hide their background. A Harris would quietly become a Horowitz. A, a Stewart would become a Steinberg. Just to have a chance uh, of being given a fair shake and making their way in their chosen profession. Uh, one chilly evening in 1946 here in Hyde Park, uh, as the fall quarter headed once again towards Hanukkah and the Gentiles on campus got ready with a sigh for eight consecutive nights of Chinese food, uh, <laughs> this little group of professors decided to start an informal event to let off steam and celebrate their heritage in an atmosphere of safety. The lobster ham and cheese debate, as it was then called, uh, <laughs> slowly gained in popularity and outgrew its original venue in the Hillel building. And as Gentiles finally broke into academia in substantial numbers and were allowed to live their identity publicly without fear of ostracism or reproach, what had been a small private gathering became a beloved university tradition for all. Uh, you might assume, as I did at first, that the question before us is, which of these foods, lakas or hamatashin, is more delicious? If that were our question, there would be no point in holding a debate. Uh, the answer would be so obvious as to be not even worth stating. Uh, but uh, as Rabbi uh, Levin Rosen uh, emphasized, and as the posters uh, advertising tonight's debate uh, indicate, we're faced with a much subtler and more difficult and more interesting question, which of these foods is more out of this world? Um, here answers do not come so easily. Our question is a metaphysical one and must be addressed with the gravity appropriate to that subject. So uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein tells us at 5.62 in the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, the world is my world, the world and life are one, I am my world. Uh, but just as Descartes' cogito, I think therefore I am, should not be understood as an autobiographical remark, but rather as an invitation to, for the reader to become a meditator, him or herself, it is clear that Wittgenstein doesn't mean Wittgenstein by I, he means me. Uh, uh, and if, to anticipate my thesis tonight, hamantaschen are out of this world, while lakas, by contrast, are in it, it follows by a simple logical substitution of co-referring expressions that if lakas are in the world, and I am the world, then lakas are in me, where they, where they should be. Uh, uh, at the same time, Wittgenstein uh, claims at 6.41 that goodness, quote, must lie, lie outside the world. If this is right, uh, and hamantaschen are out of this world while lakas are trapped inside it, then hamantaschen and only hamantaschen are good. I will return to this thorny issue in the second hour of my talk. Uh, Wittgenstein did not discuss lakas and hamantaschen in the Tractatus, but um, being from Vienna, he spent page after page discussing the Zakertort, uh, uh, a mouth-watering Viennese chocolate cake. Uh, to give just one example, he asserts the following proposition on the first page of the book, uh, 1.13, die Tatsachen im logischen Raum sind die Welt, which, if my German doesn't fail me, is the Zakertorten in logical space are the world. Uh, uh, Wittgenstein makes the, uh, this remark at 6.44 in the Tractatus, not how the world is is the mystical, but that it is. Here he's raising the classic Leibnizian question, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, the question, Martin Heidegger, a perennial Hillel Person of the Year Award nominee, uh, called the fundamental question of metaphysics. Uh, elsewhere in that same book, Introduction to Metaphysics, in 1953, he makes some ominous comments about the relation between Jewish food and politics. Most notoriously, uh, he uh, speaks of, quote, the inner truth and greatness of national socialism. Um, <laughs> We must acknowledge the philosopher Sidney Morgenbesser's reply to Leibniz, uh, if there were nothing, you'd still be complaining. Um, Wittgenstein tells us in Culture and Value, because that's just how he is, that, quote, the Jew must see to it that in a literal sense, all things are as nothing to him. But what is nothing? With this question, we need all the help we can get. I hope that here tonight, we can at least agree that nothing is nothing, not even nothing. Uh, everything is something. Um, but this only takes us so far. Uh, in my core course this quarter, my students and I have been reading Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and his Doctrine of the Mean. In this spirit, I propose to attack the question of nothingness by considering a food exactly equidistant between lakas and hamantaschen. There we go, the donut. Um, 
so they're, they're fried in oil like latkes, but they're dessert pastries like hamantaschen. Um, Jerry Seinfeld, a philosopher whose very name means field of being, has recently <laughs> provided the canonical discussion of the metaphysics of donuts. So there it is. Uh, the crucial claim uh, is that a whole is, quote, such a freaky metaphysical concept to begin with, you can't sell people holes, holes a hole does not exist. But Seinfeld's trenchant comments notwithstanding, holes, thank goodness, do exist. Uh, if they didn't, it would, for example, have been much harder to get into Mandel Hall tonight. Uh, and Pocket Seinfeld, you can sell people holes. You, you sell someone a cheese grater, you sell them holes. Uh, if you're skeptical, try selling one without the holes. Uh, <laughs> It's the holes that people are interested in. Uh, though the German-Jewish uh, journalist Kurt Tucholsky was right to observe in 1931 that, quote, there is no such thing as a hole by itself, all the same, the rest of the greater is just a necessary condition on the holes. The holes are what they're paying for. <laughs> this conflation of holes with nothing and our general confusion about the nature of nothing infiltrates even our symbols. For example, we use the symbol zero, uh, in other words, a hole. Uh, precisely because we think both that holes are nothing and that zero is nothing. But this just shows the error of our ways because not only are holes not nothing, zero isn't nothing either. Zero is a number and a perfectly good one. As Frege says, it functions as an answer to a how many question. For example, it answers, alas, the question, how many pull-ups could I do even if my very life depended on it? Uh, Holes are made of nothing, but this does not mean that they are nothing, since you can make something out of nothing, as I am doing tonight. Uh, uh, Se Seinfeld, like so many philosophers before him, including the great British empiricist philosophers John Locke and David Humantaschen, uh, is assuming that must, something must be material in order to exist, a strange mistake for a comedian of all people to make, since he manufactures immaterial things for a living. Where are jokes? What is their shape? How quickly do they move? How much do they weigh? Holes, uh, unlike jokes, do at least have spatial location. You can point to them. Uh, let me go back. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there, there's the hole. Uh, uh, thi this is what philosophers in the philosophical literature call the host of the hole, or what lay people call the good part. Uh, not only is the donut hole immaterial, but the donut uh, host, that this part of the, of the donut hole, uh, isn't identical to any matter either. The way to see this is by applying Leibniz's principle of the indiscernibility of identicals. If A is identical to B, then you, if you destroy A, you necessarily destroy B. But if you eat and digest a donut, you destroy the donut, but not the matter, which simply assumes a much, much less appealing form. Uh, Though holes are made of nothing, they may contain something. Uh, this something is called the guest in the philosophical literature on holes. For example, most donut holes have air in them. Uh, this is because nature abhors a vacuum, and I'm told the feeling is mutual. Um, <laughs> but while you can fill a hole with many things, you can't fill it with just anything. This could become a very different talk at this juncture, uh, but, but uh, my, my kids are here, so, uh, so I'm going to remain on the side of propriety and decorum. Uh, so you, you can't fill a hole with just anything. A, a hole in the earth uh, filled with water is possible, but a hole in the earth filled with earth is at best an X hole. Uh, a hole cannot be identified with empty space because when you walk along 53rd Street with holes in your pants, either for fashion reasons or otherwise, the holes are moving, but the regions of space you and your holes move through are not. Um, I'll end my discussion of holes with uh, my favorite quote about them, again from Kurt Tucholsky from 1931. This is one of my favorite quotes about anything. Uh, he says, the strangest thing about a hole is its edge. The edge is still part of the something, but it constantly overlooks the nothing, a border guard of matter. Nothingness has no such guard. While the molecules at the edge of a hole get dizzy because they are staring into a hole, the molecules of the hole get fermi? There's no word for the opposite of dizzy. For our language was created by the something people. The whole people speak a language of their own." Uh, close quote. Hamantaschen are Haman's pockets, or in other words, bags. Um, I only recently learned that pockets are bags, but that's what they are. They're little bags sewn into your clothes. I, I find that very upsetting, but you know. Um, what is a bag, metaphysically speaking? Um, um, is this a bag, for example? Uh, you might think a bag needs to face this way. Uh, 
Um, but that isn't right. So for example, balloons, it turns out, are bags. Again, I didn't know that, but I, I uh, <laughs> look it up. Um, so, so I think hats may be head bags, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, like a hole, a bag is defined by the space it encloses, um, yet a bag is not a hole, nor does it contain a hole, or at least not a hole you discover until you get home from your shopping trip. Uh, the defining joke of topology is that topologists cannot tell a coffee mug apart from a donut, since the two are homeomorphic. You can turn the one into the other by stretching and bending, uh, but not cutting or gluing. In this way, and in only this way, lakas and hamantashen are exactly the same and keep each other company here on Earth, while donuts, being holy, are transcendental. Uh, <laughs> But while a bag is not a hole, it pretends to be one. In other words, and please pay attention to this, this is my final uh, slide, it's the crucial move of the talk. A bag, and more specifically a pocket, for example, a hamantash, is something pretending to be something, which as we just saw, is itself a something pretending to be a nothing. That's the, so uh, 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 hamantash, and in short, are simulations of simulations of nothingness. Uh, they're, they're realities doubly disguised as illusions. In this way, hamantashen are, I would argue, divine. That is real but elusive or hidden. Um, what better proof that hamantashen are out of this world? Uh, lakas, uh, by contrast, are chaotic. Uh, they were there in the beginning, the shapeless tohu abohu spoken of in Genesis. <laughs> Nothing could be more worldly than a laka. Uh, as Aristotle said, natural substances are a union of form and matter. In this way, we might conclude that neither lakas nor hamantashen exist, at least here on Earth, for a laka is all matter and no form, while hamantash is all form and no matter. This conclusion, if we were forced to make it, shouldn't trouble us. Almost nothing exists. Why should lakas and hamantashen be any different? Um, but this troubling conclusion would be premature. Lakas, though messy, do have a little bit of form. Hamantash and for all their austerity do have a little bit of matter, but still we can take them to represent these two aspects of reality and can therefore conclude, I think, that Hamantash and belong to the realm of Plato's forms and are therefore definitely more out of this world than Laka's. The only question that remains is this, should food be out of this world? Is it a virtue in food to be otherworldly? And the answer, of course, is no. Uh, who wants some abstract coffee or an ethereal ice cream cone? Uh, food is for here and now, and so the very fact that Hamantashen are more out of this world entails, I think, that Lakas win this contest. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Khaled. Uh, next up. Uh, is uh, Professor Leslie Kay, who is a professor in the S Department of Psychology in the Cognition and Integrative Neuroscience programs. She also trains graduate students in computational neuroscience, neurobiology, and biophysics. She is a member of the Institute for Mind and Biology, where she served as director for many years. Her laboratory studies, her laboratory studies behavioral neurophysiology of the olfactory sense, mostly in rats. This will be Professor Kay's 19th winter at the University of Chicago. She has many years of experience eating both latkes and hamantaschen, and she is our next debater. Gosh. Um. <laughs> so first, I, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Rabbi Anna Levin Rosen for inviting me to participate. This is perhaps the most thrilling single thing I've been invited to do in all my time on the faculty here. <laughs> as a lifelong fan of the Latke, I am happy to use my extensive training as a scientist and as a specialist in the chemical senses to argue the supremacy of this delicious food. I was trained in the Chicago tradition, but in a different place, St. John's College. I learned there, as we do here, to go directly to the original text for explication of a problem. In the course of this intensely dialectical education, I was exposed to a previously unknown dialogue of Plato's in which Socrates discusses how to evaluate the latke and the hamantash. As we know, the Jews learned a lot of things from the Greeks, but it is less well known that the Greeks learned from the Jews. Few people know that Socrates learned from the Jews about the importance of the sense of smell. His intense study of Jewish texts allowed him to predict 
in the fifth century BCE, not only the inevitability of the future holidays of Purim and Hanukkah, but also their symbolic foods. <laughs> Tonight, I will summarize for you Socrates' argument from this important dialogue with some excursions into modern science and culture. And the Lord God formed the human out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the human became a living soul. From the beginning, it is clear that the nose is more important than the mouth. <laughs> God did not animate Adam by giving him mouth to mouth. <laughs> he blew into his nose. I do not suggest you try this. You might end up swapping out someone's soul for your bad breath. The Talmud tells us that smell is the sensation that can delight the soul without engaging the body. This is true. Which, in good platonic fashion, we should take as a sign of holiness or purity. Now, in the Garden of Eden, the sense of smell never experienced sin. Eve heard the serpent, she saw the fruit, which in some interpretations is an apple. She touched the fruit and she tasted it. Nowhere is smell mentioned. It's true. <laughs> the great Hasidic scholar, Rabbi Tzvi Elimelech of Dinaf or Bnei Yizachar, or Yizachar, depending on which camp you're in, <laughs> presents this as true evidence that the sense of smell is pure and more holy than the others. This is also true. It remains in the state it was before sin. This evidence is why Socrates claimed that we should base our evaluation primarily on the sense of smell. This insight has also led me as a neuroscientist to reevaluate what we know about brain organization. I announce here for the very first time a breakthrough in understanding mammalian brains. <laughs> you see here a diagram of a human brain showing how sensory information arrives in the cerebral cortex, which many believe is where thinking happens. All sensory stimuli except for odors are processed in the thalamus before being distributed to the cortex. This organization has puzzled neuroscientists for a very long time. <laughs> so, going back to the textual evidence, we can now assign the thalamus as the origin of sin and its distribution into sinful thoughts. Olfactory information, on the other hand, goes directly from the nose to the cortex, bypassing the thalamus. The olfactory bulb is the first place in cerebral cortex to receive smell input from the nose. It is anterior to, or before, <laughs> the thalamus, and thus, before sin. So, olfactory thoughts are pure thoughts. Smell is also what makes taste into flavor. Taste without smell is just sweet, salty, bitter, sour, and umami. <laughs> umami is a savory flavor, as in meat, soy sauce, or small amounts of MSG. This is true. <laughs> we smell via two roots, and both are important for appreciating, say, a glass of wine, but also food. The idea of the wine or the food requires both inputs, the orthonasal root, or what is listed here as nasal olfaction, is when we sniff and smell something by breathing in, drawing air through the nose. This is normal. The retronasal root is activated when we put foods in our mouths and smell by air passing backwards out of our noses as long as you chew with your mouth closed like your mother taught you. 
Now, I'm going to show you a video. And this video shows two things. The first is a great demonstration of airflow and retronasal smelling. The second thing is to remind us that cold things have little taste and little smell because odors don't volatilize well when food is cold. So there's little to smell by sniffing cold food, and the little bit of retronasal smell comes from being heated up in the mouth. Watch as this boy eats a cereal ball frozen with liquid nitrogen. <laughs> he only tastes sweet. There's no flavor, just sweet in this treat, and that's from the sugary syrup in which he dips the frozen ball. <laughs> See, if you chew with your mouth closed, you, you have the full experience. <laughs> so, smell is what all makes taste into flavor. So, which of these foods provides the better flavor experience? They both smell delicious in different ways while cooking, while hot, but we eat the latke hot, right? We have <laughs> retro plus orthonasal makes more smell. The full smell experience, importantly, it involves the nasal pathway, the one by which the Almighty breathed life into Adam. More smell, more holy. The hamantash, we eat cold. Mostly retronasal smell of a cold food, so less holy. But how else can smell tell us about which food is better? In numbers, God commands the Jewish people to provide a pleasing odor as an offering. God wants to smell stuff. <laughs> if we were to take hamantash and, and latkes, as offerings to the temple, which set of ingredients would be holier or better? What kind of odor does God desire? The odor comes from the stuff that's burned on the altar, and that odor depends on the ingredients. So let's deconstruct the two samples to see what's in them. On the latke side, olive oil was a part of every offering at the temple. It is not traditional to cook the latkes in olive oil, but vegetable oil is close. If you add schmaltz to the vegetable oil, it makes them less vegetarian, but more delicious. <laughs> this would also be consistent with what's called a bird offering. On the hamantash side, in biblical times, there was no granulated white sugar, but historians explain that date syrup referred to in the Torah as honey, was probably used as a sweetener. Produce was also given in many offerings. Eggs were commonly eaten, but not mentioned relative to the sacrifice. Butter and vanilla, we'll discuss these in a bit. Both recipes contain wheat, which is the main component of many offerings in the temple. Of what form was this wheat? unleavened. Everyone knows that matzah meal makes a better latke than flour. But baking powder? Really? <laughs> Forbidden for an offering. <laughs> what about sugar? In Leviticus 2.11 we read, for you shall not cause to go up and smoke any leavening or any honey as a, firing, as a fire offering to the Lord. No sugar. Things are not looking good for the hamantash. <laughs> what other smells are pleasing odors to God? Let's take a peek inside the temple where the offerings were made to see if we can figure this out. I have some actual photographs from the time of the second temple. <laughs> this is a real thing. <laughs> you can buy these kits. Um, this is from the courtyard outside the inner sanctum. Sacrifices were offered here, and the leftovers of the sacrifice 
were eaten by the priest and his staff. The people could offer unleavened, unleavened items baked in an oven, cooked on a griddle, fried in a pan, or roasted. All meal offerings were made with oil and salt and no sugar or leaven. Vegetables could also be offered. Onions were common. Potatoes and poppy seeds, not so much. But where does it say that God wants vanilla and butter? <laughs> Furthermore, the Talmud describes the pan offering as a crisp preparation that is fried in a shallow pan over the fire. And it consists of flat cakes over which an additional, additional oil is then poured. Sounds like a latke. The ingredients of a latke could therefore become a latke as they are fried on the range top or the altar. There is no oven here for baking cookies, as we can plainly see, even in the holy of holies. <laughs> What did it smell like in there? We've already established it could smell very much like latkes, at least with the vegetarian offerings. Inside and all over the temple was the smell of holy anointing oil and incense, which contributed to the pleasing odor. What did that smell like? These are the ingredients of the incense as described in Exodus, or the anointing oil as described in Exodus. The oil is on everything, including the priest's clothes, so this must have been a pervasive scent in the temple. The entire batch contained close to 40 pounds of spice in a gallon and a half of olive oil. That's really strong perfume. About one third of the mixture was myrrh. Maybe you've smelled that. Calamus has a greasy or nutty smell. It probably blended nicely with the olive oil. One sixth by weight was Ceylon cinnamon or cinnamomum verum, a somewhat less spicy cinnamon than what we commonly use. But wait, what is cassia really? Here it is as a tea, but the anointing oil was not for tea. Cassia is also a type of cinnamon. In fact, this is common cinnamon, what we use every day from the cassia cinnamomum tree. So half the weight of the incense is cinnamon, with the odor coming from large quantities of a chemical called cinnamaldehyde, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yes, really, so what did it smell like in the Holy of Holies? <laughs> This is a horrifying possibility. <laughs> Could malls all over America be bringing us a whiff of the divine without our even being aware of it? <laughs> is Cinnabon a holy food? Probably not. Even aside from the leavening, why not? No sugar, no vanilla, no butter in the Holy of Holies. So let's recap on the holy odors. <laughs> In addition to cinnamon, myrrh, and a few other things, the holy incense, which was also described in Exodus, contained saffron, frankincense, and salt. These, some of these are described in the Talmud, which has actually a recipe from the Second Temple time. Um, cooking onions and produce, oil and matzo mill, plus cinnamon and other spices. These are holy odors. Butter, vanilla, sugar, unholy. Where does the cinnamon go? None in the hamantaschen, but the latkes have applesauce. <laughs> Many scholars argue that the fruit in the tr of the tree in the Garden of Eden was an apple. So to conclude, I will read the conclusion of Plato's dialogue, Patataki e Hamanos, which puts this all together. Socrates says, 
So, knowing that the nose is the root to all that is holy, we mix the odors of frying potatoes, onion, matzah, and oil to make a pleasing odor. If we add applesauce, we can thereby redeem the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge by the addition of the holy cinnamon to the applesauce. <laughs> the latke, therefore, is not only an offering to the God of the Jews, but also a redemption for all humanity. <laughs> Hamanos replies, it must be so, Socrates. <laughs> I rest my case. Hamantash has taken down the chin so far. So we look to Professor Paula Worthington uh, to try to shore up the uh, position for the Hamantash and lovers out there. Uh, Professor Worthington is a senior lecturer at the Harris School of Public Policy, where she also serves as academic director of the school's Policy Labs program. At Harris, she teaches courses in state and local government and cost-benefit analysis, and advises students completing applied projects for public and nonprofit sector clients. She's consistently recognized for her excellence in teaching, having received nine, count them, nine Best Teacher Awards since joining Harris in 2004. While on leave from Harris this year, Worthington served as Senior Economist at the Council of Economic Advisors in Washington, D.C. In Hyde Park, she is a member of KAM Isaiah Israel Congregation, where she and her husband have served as board members and officers. Her sons were B'nai Mitzvah, and she is a sometime member of the Temple's Klezmer Band. Professor Worthington. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Dean Fagelson, for your kind introduction. And thank you, Rabbi Rosen, for inviting me to participate in this evening's debate. I'm really glad we've set aside time to focus on things that are really important, like food, Jewish holidays, food, academic freedom, food, intellectual creativity, and of course, food, before the, before the debate and after. So. Where to begin? My academic home, the Harris School of Public Policy, prides itself on its evidence-based approach to policymaking. We are critical thinkers who apply scientific methods and rigor to all sorts of problems and issues. Social impact down to a science. That's our mantra. My colleagues at Harris investigate timely, relevant, and important public policy issues. For example, my colleague Damon Jones has found that unconditional cash transfer programs may not damage the work incentives of recipients after all. Another example comes from my colleague Chris Berry, whose research has highlighted the regressivity of local property value assessments. Tonight, however, we meet not to debate workforce or tax policy, but instead to assess the relative merits of two traditional Jewish treats, Hamantaschen and Lachis. So, Applying the Harris School Toolkit, what can we say? Let's start with prices. <laughs> I know, I know. You're thinking that economists are cynics who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Uh, but, but bear with me, uh, because after extensive online research, I found that Zabar's sells both of these goodies. So you can buy Hamantaschen for $12.98 for 13 ounces, and you can buy latkes for $12.98 a pound. Seem kind of similar in price. The problem is that these prices are for different quantities. So we need to standardize prices based on weight. So it's a minor adjustment, but on a standardized per item basis, we find that latkes are a little more expensive than hamantasha. But there's another problem. No one ever eats just one latke. In fact, people eat at least three, for sure. So we need to price per serving, not per item. And there's yet another problem as we think about prices. We also know that no one eats latkes without all kinds of condiments. So eating a bare naked latke would be like eating this. <laughs> instead of this. 
So we need to make sure we adjust for condiments too. And after all of those adjustments, I estimate that on a condiment-adjusted, standardized, per-serving basis, <laughs> latkes are nearly four times as expensive as hamantashen. <laughs> so, given these prices, how much will people really want to buy and consume? The theory of consumer behavior can help us here. Utility-maximizing consumers will choose the bundle of Lockheeds and Hamantaschen that maximizes their utility or well-being, given prices, income, and preferences. So the consumer chooses just the right amount of each good, so that at the margin, the last dollar spent on Lockheeds yields the same additional satisfaction or additional utility as the last dollar spent on Hamantaschen. I think this graph kind of sums it up pretty, pretty nicely. <laughs> So uh, we can become a little more formal with this by turning to the Cobb-Douglas utility function uh, to examine consumer decision-making. We write utility as a function of several items, including the number of servings of Lockies, the number of servings of Hamantaschen, and then a couple of arbitrary parameters that I'm just going to make up. Uh, a scaling factor and a Cobb-Douglas preference parameter. So by choosing these parameter values to match basic consumption patterns in the United States, I can calculate the welfare loss to consumers if they were unable to consume Lockheed's or Hamantaschen at all. So how much worse off would consumers be if they couldn't eat Lockheed's or couldn't eat Hamantaschen? Well, my calculations indicate that driving Lockheed consumption to zero would decrease consumer welfare by $20, while decreasing Hamantaschen consumption to zero would decrease consumer welfare by only $5. So this tells us that on a per-serving basis, the enjoyment from Lockheed's is $20, and the enjoyment from Hamantaschen is only $5. So it seems like we're done. We value the enjoyment people get from consuming a serving of these treats, even after taking into account the prices, excuse me, the prices they pay for them. And Lockheed's seem like the clear winner. But there's a problem. <laughs> what about the impacts of consuming these treats even on people who don't eat them? Fortunately, at the Harris School, we have a lot of experience with the perfect analytical tool, cost-benefit analysis. Using this method, we can systematically assess and evaluate the benefits and costs to all of society arising from the consumption of Lockheed's and Hamantaschen, thus scientifically answering the question, which treat is best? Of course, Harris is not the first or only place where CBA, or cost-benefit analysis, has been applied to pressing questions such as, what are the benefits and costs of living life itself? <laughs> well, The Onion's rigorous study of the pros and cons of living considered the values of tangibles, such as median income and home ownership costs, as well as intangibles, such as finding inner peace, establishing emotional closeness with family members, and brief moments of joy. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Onion study concluded that it was unwise to go on living. But seriously, cost-benefit analysis has long been a foundation for our government's approach to regulation and rulemaking. President Reagan signed Executive Order 12291 requiring CBA for all major new proposed rules and regulations. President Clinton signed EO 12866 revising and expanding review processes and procedures. President Obama signed EO 13563, requiring consideration of values that are difficult or impossible to quantify, including equity, human dignity, fairness, and distributive impacts. And President Trump signed EO 13771, requiring federal agencies to eliminate two existing rules for every proposed new rule. <laughs> So 
So what is our situation? Our, in our case, we wish to calculate the net benefits experienced in society from consumption of these two treats. Our approach is grounded in the belief that we should make choices that maximize the net benefits to society, where the net benefits are defined as the difference between benefits and costs. So which treat generates higher net benefits to society? We need to catalog the impacts, to be sure. We know that one of the key impacts is the direct benefits of consumption, which we've already calculated. We know that Lockheed's generate $20 in consumer surplus per serving, compared with only $5 for Hamantaschen. But we must also consider indirect consumption benefits, or co-benefits, defined as impacts that are typically unrelated or secondary to the secondary purpose of the rulemaking. And of course, we must consider externalities, which are the costs imposed on individuals who are not actually consuming the treats at all. Once again, we have a problem, though. What if a program or a policy generates both winners and losers? In the present case, what if eating these treats improves the welfare of some people, but makes other people worse off? Who's better off? Who's worse off? And how can we compare these impacts? We know there are winners from consuming latkes and hamantaschen. Even more winners if we consider that kids sometimes enjoy helping in the kitchen. But let's not forget about the losers here. <laughs> so how do we add up these impacts across people? Fortunately, we have a solution in standard cost-benefit analysis. We're going to apply the Calder-Hicks criterion and describe a policy or program as desirable as long as the winners from the policy can, in principle, compensate the losers. Now, in the present case, we note that children's obligations without measure include honoring their mothers and fathers. So surely we think that the undying love and affection from child to parent is enough to compensate a parent for the occasional messy kitchen. So with that behind us, we now turn to the co-benefits of consumption. How should co-benefits be treated? One approach is to consider and count all of the impacts of a proposed rule or policy, whether from the intended purpose or not. Until recently, U.S. regulators commonly used this approach when analyzing the impacts of proposed health, safety, and environmental regulations. Since 2017, however, regulators have moved to disregard such incidental benefits in their analyses. Some observers, of course, have welcomed that change in regulatory practices. The thing is, these co-benefits can really affect the outcome of a cost-benefit analysis. Consider the EPA's clean power plan. The EPA's most recent analysis shows that the primary benefits from the rules generate annual climate benefits of only $500 million by 2030, while the ancillary health benefits from reducing fine particulate matter and sulfur dioxide would be 10 to 20 times as great. With these co-benefits in place, the Clean Power Plan passes a net benefits test and is a good idea, but without them, it isn't. In the present context, we must consider the possible co-benefits from consumption. Let's consider Lockheed's first. Lockheed's are higher calorie. They are higher fat. And they are loaded with cholesterol and sodium. Worse, as we've already understood, we don't eat them naked, we eat them loaded. All right, so the numbers are really bad, and sadly for Lockheed's, the co-benefits of consumption are actually negative. So how do we monetize those impacts? Well, we're going to take the approach of looking at how much people pay to avoid bad things, like cholesterol, and use that to indirectly value the good thing they want, like good health. So we start by observing that the U.S. market for cholesterol drugs is over $10 billion a year. If cutting Lockheed consumption to zero meant no further need to buy and take these prescription meds, 
that would save an estimated $16.46 per serving. So sadly, the co-benefits of latke consumption are indeed negative. Hamantashen, on the other hand, I think the situation is reversed. We note the obvious benefits for digestive health coming from selective hamantashen consumption. <laughs> Those health benefits come all quite naturally, eliminating the need for supplements or medications. Clearly, hamantashen generate lots of ancillary health benefits. So, how do we monetize those benefits? Well, we consider that the over-the-counter uh, market for digestive health products was $5 billion last year. And since regular consumption of hamantashen with prune filling keeps people more regular, I estimate that this consumption saves digestive health-related spending of about $15.38 per serving. And now we must consider the possibility of negative externalities. Executive Order 13563 clearly directs us to consider even hard to value impacts such as the scents and odors associated with frying and baking these holiday treats. Do your neighbors like it when you prepare these treats in your kitchen or not? In the absence of relevant data, I expect that people hate the smell of used cooking oil but love the scent of freshly baked cookies. This tilts the analysis in favor of the hamantashen, of course. And of course, no contemporary discussion about externalities is complete without touching on carbon emissions. <laughs> the logic here is straightforward. Making these treats requires energy. That means putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So, what do the numbers look like? Let's take a look at the math. Don't worry, the calculations are really simple, straightforward. The key point is that baking hamantashen requires more energy, hence generates more carbon emissions than does frying latkes. But how should we value those carbon emissions? Economists and others have worked for years to estimate the social cost of carbon or the value of damages associated with the emission of one more metric ton of carbon dioxide. A U.S. interagency working group has previously estimated this cost at $40 per metric ton. With that estimate, I find that the costs are indeed higher for hamantashen, which thus contribute more to global warming than do latkes. Finally, every cost-benefit analysis includes a table summarizing its results. So let's take a look. Here it is. This table tells us that Lockheeds generate lots of consumer surplus, but also generate negative health impacts, odors, and atmospheric damage. Hamantashen, on the other hand, produce modest consumer surplus, but also generate significant positive health impacts and pleasant aromas, while admittedly contributing more to climate change. Now, those of you who can do the math in your heads have probably already figured it out, but these numbers clearly indicate it's hamantashen for the win. So hamantashen generate higher net benefits to society, generating $20.36 per serving compared with a paltry $3.53 for latkes. Key points to remember, <laughs> consumers love latkes and can't eat just one. Co-benefits are crucial here, and hard to quantify impacts are hard to quantify. Social cost of carbon matters in principle, but not in practice on a per-serving basis. <laughs> we conclude by noting that both treats taste good, but hamantashen are better overall for society. 
And with that, I leave you to consider what kind of tikkun olam lies ahead for you this holiday season. <laughs> Thank you, and hak Good evening. My name is Seth, and I'm a senior engagement intern and member of the advisory board at Hillel. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and thank you to all the parents, alumni, and friends of Hillel who are watching the debate live online all over the world. The Laka Hamatash debate, which originated in the Hillel building on Woodlawn 72 years ago, has changed dramatically over the years. These days, versions of the debate can be seen around the country on many colleges camp college campuses. With that being said, an event of this size cannot be done without the help of many different people who deserve a brief moment of appreciation. First of all, I want to thank Dean Fagelson and the wonderful debaters for the rigorous inquiry into this very heated matter. While I, like most people, made up my mind before entering this event, your thoughtful and rigorous debate further helped me remain convicted in my original decision. <laughs> I would also like to thank the staff of Reynolds Club, Carl Fogel on the piano, Rhythm and Jews, and all the volunteers and staff at Hillel who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make tonight a success. Thanks to the Gmunder family and all of you who supported this debate and Jewish life on campus all the 364 days other than today. This year, we've transitioned the debate from Monday night before th to Monday night before Thanksgiving as opposed to Tuesday night. We hope this change will allow you to consume more food tonight, knowing you have plenty of time to regain strength for the Thanksgiving meal. Besides, a nice prune hamantash should help you get ready for the food marathon to come later in the week. Now that the debate is concluded, it's time for you, the audience, to vote. To encourage everyone to fill out those ballots, I will quickly demonstrate why your vote matters. According to data about the election just a few weeks ago, 115,861,500 people, or 49.2% of eligible voters, voted. This means your vote was worth 0.000086% of the total decision. In Mandel Hall, there are 364 seats, and based on this data, only about 375 of you will actually vote. This means that tonight, your vote counts for 0.27%. Putting all this together, compared to election day, your vote is 313,950 times more valuable than it was. So make it count. <laughs> Finally, the University of Chicago is usually a place where theory triumphs over practice. Tonight, however, it's up for you to decide if that should be the case. Rather than simply pondering the ultimate Jewish food, you can try these treats in practice. After the debate conclude, concludes, you are all welcome to join us for a post-debate reception in McCormick Lounge to try both latkes and hamantaschen, all for a small donation of $5. Leave the theory of the debate behind and enter the real world. F lastly, please remain seated while the debaters process out. Thank you, and have a good evening. <laughs>